God did not make you to fail. If God made you to fail, we all would have been failures. God sent us to succeed. Welcome to another edition of webinar series on MBA Round 2, which we conduct with academic leaders and industry veterans. As the American polymath and one of the founding fathers of US, Benjamin Franklin wrote, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. If you are lucky enough to have a mentor, be proactive enough about nurturing the relationship. Mentor and mentee relationship go hand in hand. Leadership is an opportunity to give back and mentoring is the best way to build future leaders. Everyone has a hunch about what's up next, how technology will evolve, but the most important point to focus is where innovation meets business and mentors play an important role here, which is also the key point for a successful startup. To discuss these aspects in depth, we have with us our very special guest, Mr. Abdullah Hassan, and we shall be discussing with him on the importance of mentorship and how to find a great mentor. Mr. Abdullah Hassan serves as the CEO of Dow Capital. He drives Dow Capital strategy and is involved in all the investment phases, including exploring investment opportunities, evaluating, negotiating, and selecting. He has over 17 years of experience in telecommunications and technology. Prior to joining Dow Capital, he served as business development director of British Telecom in Middle East and North Africa region. He also worked as CEO of Wireless Internet Mobile Data, which is Kuwait's first Wi-Fi operator. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Anshul. So sir, I have a certain set of questions on which we will request your views today, please. And I'd like to start off with the first question of the day for you, please. Go ahead. So entrepreneurship is hard, as everybody knows. And someone who has walked that path can understand the various issues and guide you appropriately. It always helps if you are mentored by someone who has gone through the process of entrepreneurship and has been successful at it. We would request your views and suggestions and how a mentee can find such a mentor and what is the process you would suggest to the budding and student entrepreneurs, please. Your request on this, please. Great. It's an interesting topic. I, I teach about this. Um, I do a lot of lecturing in this area of entrepreneurship. I think the, the concept of mentoring and mentors are, are probably one of the most fundamental elements of success for an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, especially uh, the millennials that are today and the younger ones, what they do is they have an exciting idea. They have an amazing sense of passion. They're driven. They can't sleep in the night. They need to make their startup work. They're always busy. They're working hard. They're talking to colleagues, co-founders, everybody else. And somehow they want to take it off. They want to launch. They want to be successful. The thirst and desire for success gets so big and so large that sometimes they end up making fundamental mistakes. And those fundamental mistakes become embedded in the nature of work that they do. And they don't surface until the business is launched. And once the business is launched, those embedded problems and challenges surface. And because of which failure is most likely to meet them than success. Now, young entrepreneurs, have a lot of things with them, a lot of good things. Uh, they have the zeal, they have the desire, the hunger that we talked about. They're very passionate. They, they can sacrifice everything and anything that you can, you can ask them to do. But the one thing that they lack is experience. The second thing that they lack is exposure. And these two E's are very important for an entrepreneur to succeed. And these two E's are very much abundantly available with the experienced, well-rounded uh, uh, mentor. These mentors are people who are considered the wise men of society. These wise men are the people who basically have seen a lot of scenarios and have come to some baseline assessments. And they know 
that from an operational standpoint, this should work. From a fundamental standpoint, that should work. From an objective standpoint, you should be there, etc. Now, experience has no substitute. We've heard that so many times, so many times. Our teachers said it to us, our parents said it to us, uh, our, our society leaders said it to us. But in the world of entrepreneurship, this is very true. It is the most expensive luxury that you can find which is good wisdom, because good wisdom will only come with something that is good at the right time for you. In my own personal experience, when I mentor uh, people that I have invested with or people that I sit on the board with or people who are engaging me as a mentor, I've realized that just a few lines of, of advice over a very short call turned out to be a very fundamental change to the entrepreneur's business because they never thought of it. And one of them is usually the legal part. So entrepreneurs are not good at drawing up contracts. They don't think in their list of priorities, you will never see a contract as an important element. And for me, it's very important. You need to have contract with your suppliers. You need to have contracts with your customers. You need to have contracts even when you do pilots. I was just telling one of the entrepreneurs yesterday, a very good young a boy and his group from Lucknow and UP, and they are about to sign up with the Delhi government. And I told him, listen, when you're signing a pilot, you need to sign up a KPI. He said, oh, okay, that's great. I said, no, that's not just great because if you don't have a KPI, then at the end of the pilot, you will not be able to sign a contract because the customer will say, well, I expected this, but you delivered that. Before you start a pilot, you need to set up the KPIs and then sign up a pilot agreement, even if it's non-commercial, even if it's pro bono, you're not going to sign for it any money, but you need to have conditions for it. Similarly, when you take up employees, you need to have contract. You need to let your employees know that this is serious and their work here is supposed to deliver productive success, objective success. So mentors, they bring a lot of value. The value that they bring is experience, is exposure. These two E's are very, very relative to the third E, which is expensive. So if you want to make an expensive mistake, miss these two E's. If you want to make an expensive wisdom-based choice, use these two E's. Wonderful. The two E's, experience and exposure, are the mantra for the young founders. So nicely related. Let me come down to my second question, please. So it is usually said that it is good to avoid strongly opinionated mentors so that there is space to discuss different viewpoints and merge on common grounds quickly. Do you feel this is important? And should this be taken into consideration while you are starting working, working with your mentor? Okay, so as a mentor, I need to first understand that my mentee is at which level. Is my mentee excavating the ground? Is my mentee set the foundation for his building? Has my mentee come to the ground floor? Is my mentee working on the pillars to go to floor one, two, three? Because I know the minute he's on floor one, he just needs to replicate everything. So as a mentor, I need to show responsibility to understand his situation before giving my advice. Advice should not be commodity. It should not be cheap. It should be very expensive, like I said. Why? Because you need to Consider many factors. Advice is not just because, oh, I'm this great experienced guy and I'm CEO of this and I head a fund and I do lectures, etc. So I can be careless by just giving random. And this is a mistake I've seen many a times in, in my career that I've seen people go to mentors who are actually not even from the industry. So they sign up a mentor just because he or she has a successful startup. So someone launched, let's say, a successful startup of uh, a dairy, a milk dairy. And now my startup is fintech. And I signed this guy up because he's a billionaire. He, he's made billions out of his dairy business. But it's dairy business. It's got nothing to do with banking. It's got nothing to do with what I'm doing in fintech. So I, even if my father knows him, my teacher knows him, and he, he can be my mentor, he's not good for me. Everything that he's going to say is not going to matter. Always remember, there are three la layers of advices. One is casual advice. Second is motivational advice. And third is business relative advice. The best one is the last one business relative advice. Always choose mentors that have business relativity, that can add value to what you're doing. 
So in terms of trying to find the common ground, yes, both the mentor and the mentee have to reach consensus to understand whether this relationship is going to work or no. Is this the right mentor? Is this the right mentee? Can I add value to you? As a professional, I don't want to waste my time. And hence, I don't want to waste his time. I don't want the entrepreneur to waste energy with me. So there are many a times I refuse, I decline. People get disappointed. They, they feel even sad at times. Oh, we were hoping you would join us. Oh, we were hoping you would sit on our board. But I can't do anything for you. No, sir, we listen to your motivational speeches. You do amazing. That's motivation. That has nothing to do with business. Motivation is just trying to convince you that you can fly. Now, you need to find somebody who can find the wings in you. I can't. I can just give you the inspiration in general to say that you can take off. But I can't tell you which toe of your right or left leg will leave first. That has to be an industry-related mentor. So the responsibility of being a mentor is very big. And I get very disappointed when I see, um, when I go to India and, and other parts of Asia, that mentoring is so commodity. Everybody is a mentor. Someone who has a C to his title is a mentor. Someone who has a director to his title is a mentor. Someone who's a chairman of a company is a mentor. As a mentor, number one, you have experience, I agree. As a mentor, you have exposure, I agree. But are you the right person to productize that properly from the sign and mode of education? Because you have to pass it as education. It's not instruction. This is not your organization where I'm giving you an instruction to say, do this chart and give me this cash flow. All right, now I need a go-to-market strategy. Where is the comp comp competition landscape? It's not a delegation of job. This is an educational situation where I'm supposed to train you for something that you need to learn. I don't want you to be happy about the fact that a CEO of a big company just gave you advice. No. I need you to be happy about the fact that you got something that you can take home. So I always say in my lecture, when, when I have a large audience, I always say it at the end of it, when people are very happy, I say, listen, unfortunately, only 2% of you will take something home. Every, everybody else is just going to be inspired. That's it. Inspiration doesn't do you any good. Inspiration is like watching a Salman Khan movie and coming out thinking you have muscles. Inspiration is like watching an Amir Khan movie and getting into romance. Inspiration is like watching a Van Gogh painting and thinking, I can do this too. It's not that difficult. <laughs> you know, it seems very normal. There's a limit to where inspiration needs to stop and education needs to begin. So the responsibility of mentors is much bigger than of a mentee. Because the mentee has the ability to make mistakes. Mentors should never make mistakes. I really appreciate your candid points there. And I hope all the mentors listen to this point of view also. Let me come down to my third question, please. A mentor, while adding that value, as you suggested, spends a lot of time and resources to guide and sometimes handholds the mentee as well. As humans, we all have expectations. Kindly help us understand what are the expectations of a mentor from his mentees? All right, there are two sets of expectations. The first expectation is, um, is this person actually grabbing what I'm saying? Number one, uh, because even I need to feel confident that what I'm giving is being received, number one. Number two, is this person implementing what I'm saying the way it should be implemented? Which means that is he getting back to me? or she getting back to me and saying, sir, you, you told me this, I implied this, and this is what happened. So the feedback has to be constant. Whatever the schedule that we agreed upon, we'll meet once a week, we'll meet once a month for half an hour, for one hour, whatever that schedule um, calendar is. This is number one. Number two, I need to make sure that you have the ability to understand what I'm saying, okay? So some entrepreneurs are very hands-on. Some are very meticulous. Some are into charts, into Excels, into PowerPoint presentation. I need to make sure that which ones are you. So in terms of expectation, I need to know that you're actually taking everything in and you're applying it, number one. Number two, 
some mentors would want to have a commercial benefit. So you need to understand as an entrepreneur whether that commercial benefit is something that you can offer. So is it a monthly retainer? Is it a sweat equity in the company? Is it a board seat in the company? Is it a chairmanship? I don't know. For every mentor, it's different. Uh, for me, it's pro bono. I, I, I'm not someone who expects anything from anybody. I just want people to grow. I want economy to progress. I need societies to develop. I'm one of those who believes education is everybody's right, which means that Anshul's kids and my kids and somebody who lives in a remote village in Uttar Pradesh or Bihar or Ranchi should have the same access to lecturers that our kids have. Which means if somebody thinks that Abdullah Hassan can lecture at Oxford University Innovation, which means anybody should listen to me, not just the people who can attend Oxford. Anybody should listen to me. So for me, mentoring is different. For me, it's, it's a task. It's a task of responsibility. It's a task which I have personally driven in my life to say, I will build a change and the change will come from me. And uh, there is no cost to change. Change has to come because it's a human thing. We need to see change and change from poverty to appreciation of wealth, from uneducation to a lot of education, from unhealthiness to a lot of good health. And we can't do that if every one of us is determined to charge. Having said that, I don't disagree with mentors who charge. It is a way of, of earning. It is a way to gain respect. It is a way to keep the relationship serious. Why? I have found... But because I offer my uh, services for free, I see a lot of people taking it very random. I see a lot of casual messages uh, coming to me. Uh, and I'm sure that if I charged with people, they wouldn't be so casual with me. So there's pros and cons, but on a personal note, I don't charge. Perfect, perfect. And I could totally relate through your engagements on social media, how you are motivating the youth across the world to start up their startups and also the fact where you are helping people who have recently been unemployed to the pandemic and really appreciate your efforts there. Thank so you. We come down to the next question, please. So sure. new founders usually make the mistake of trying to convince, convince investors with their pitch rather than let their startups do the work and then help the investors understand why their startups is worth investing in. How do you suggest is the right way to convince investors to back their idea, to back their vision? All right. So before, and this is a good question. I like the question because uh, I think what I'm going to say might help a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, here's a trick. Before you go to any investor, you and your co-founders and your team, you need to prepare for the pitch. Obviously you would, but you need to dramatize it which means you need to do rehearsals. So you need to pitch to yourself, number one. Number two, find out people who are within your network and tell them we want to do a demo pitch and we want you to score us and give them, let them score you to say that, give me a score on my pitch, whether my physical pitch, my dress sense, my appearance, my voice tone, my, my keynote hits. Give me a score of one to 10, one being worse, 10 being the best. Second, my slides, whether my slides were, were impressive enough, one to 10. And number three, my closure. When I close, was my closure, was it perfect? Was my climax correct? Did I apply everything correctly? And do it with around five to 10 strangers so that they give you an honest opinion. Only and only when you get a score of more than eight in all three sectors with all these five to 10 strangers, then and only then do you go in front of investors. Do not try to convince yourself that you know what you're doing and you are basically going to do a very good job and the investor is going to be very, very happy with you. I like confident people, but I also don't like confident fools. Fools are people who convince themselves that I'm king of the world and you're not. Always take feedback. Healthy criticism is good for you because you can self-correct yourself. Don't embarrass yourself in front of an investor. If you found that everything you're doing needs a little bit tweak, a little bit change, a little bit modification, you can do that while you're not in front of the investor, number one. Number two, maybe you will decide that the entire pitch will be divided between you and the co-founders or you and the team. 
So someone will come in and do the marketing. Someone will come in and do the financials. Someone will come in and lay out the technology roadmap. And then you will come in in the beginning and in the end. Okay? I don't know. See what works for you. Create it as a scene, as a movie, as a show, as a drama. That's what pitches are. Okay? When I go on stage, I prepare everything. I, it's not random. People think it's random. It's not. It's completely not. I have to prepare myself. Even if there are no slides, even if it's just a chat, I have to prepare myself. Because if I'm not prepared, that means somebody else is connecting me to do something. Somebody else is telling me to do something. Number two, always have rules in your presentation. You ask the audience, um, I would like you to ask me questions once I'm finished. Or you can say, I would appreciate after every section if you want questions so we can finish that and move on to the next one. You decide, but you set the rules, okay? Investors can only get engaged in the first two to three minutes. Everybody says it, yes, but I give lectures for two hours and I keep people engaged. Why? If your content is good enough and then the emotion in the content is real, people will be connected with you as long as it's possible. All right. Always remember your content and your emotion has to be connected. If your startup is important to you, make it known, let it be seen, and then let it be felt. Anything that is felt is usually something that is held. So let people hold what you're giving, not just see what you're giving. Wonderful. The difference between an ordinary and extraordinary is practice. Rightly said, sir. Exactly. And I also believe in this fact. That if you are not able to sell it to yourselves, you can't sell it to the world. Exactly. So let me come down to my next question, please. Since you invest in a lot of startups, what is the difference that you see in terms of successful startup founders, vis-a-vis -vis founders who have not been able to do too well? In other words, what do you look for in founders? All right. Again, a very good question because... Uh... For me, uh, we've invested in around 13 startups in the UK and around 14 odd startups in, in, in America. And even though our fund is originally based in the Middle East, we have never invested in the Middle East. Um, even though I give a lot of uh, roadshows and lectures in India, I've never invested in India. And I'll tell you why. When I look for a startup or a founder, I am looking at somebody who's able to stand on his feet no matter what. Some people think it's about the idea, it's about the, the concept. No, it's not. Number one, I need to know that this person has relative background, which is relative to what he or she is going to do, number one. Number two, if it is not relative, I find the demeanor of that person tough enough to face difficult questions, difficult challenges. Some entrepreneurs think, I have to sound sweet, I have to sound nice. No. When I am interviewing a potential investment opportunity, I like it when the entrepreneur is challenging me because now I know this person is serious. And I've seen that out of experience. Now, it's been, our fund has been almost three and a half, four years. There are a few investors, a few entrepreneurs who failed, got up, failed, got up, and succeeded amazingly. Amazingly, amazingly, Okay. And they had issues outside, which means uh, customers were not signing up. They had issues inside, which means a co-founder became a major problem, a legal problem, etc. Okay, And yet the founder did not lose his ground. And today he's signing up multi-million pounds contracts. Okay, My job was to constantly back him up. At that time, he only needed motivation. So for me, I think the important thing for entrepreneurs to understand is that when you are looking to attract investors, make sure you show your personality correctly. Don't try to be too sweet. It's in the wrong message. It's not the right message. Okay. Don't try to sound too know-it-all, seen-it-all, because you're not. Try to let them understand that I'm getting into a game which has competition. No investor likes to hear, oh, I have no competition. No investor also likes to hear, I'm the Uber of my sector. Don't do that. I am one of those when I see a chart when somebody says, sir, the, the marketplace is worth $2 billion and I am targeting a very conservative uh, first year market of 0.5%. Who on earth told you that you will get 0.5%? Just because you think it's a negligible number? 
That's all. Don't convince yourself with silly Excel charts. Do your homework well. I want to know that you were targeting the city of Mumbai and the area of Andheri with the geo population breakdown, with the GDP spend of that area, with the competitors who are in that area, and now you tell me how many, how many people you're going to target in the first year. Don't come up with generic numbers. That only shows that you haven't done your homework. That only shows that you're getting carried away and you might get me carried away as an investor and I'll end up with you in the middle of the ocean. That is the reason why we have 90% or more failures in the startup world. Entrepreneurs do not do the prerequisites. Wonderful, wonderful. I was totally mesmerized by the answer. Wonderful. So lastly, I would request your advice and tips to our youth in India who are starting their journey as an entrepreneur, founding new companies, innovating. How should they go about it? All right, we are living in interesting times, very interesting times. And uh, the reason why I'm choosing the word interesting is because any time when things go bad in the economy, it's an opportunity. It's a very big opportunity. Now, the Great Depression that happened in the early 19th century in America created such a large economic downfall that people were literally dying of hunger. hunger. And it was only World War II that stopped the, the whole depression. But guess what happened? Because of which industrialization was launched. People realized that large industries can, can be formed. I think India and Indians need to start looking at the opportunity rather than the problem. There's a lot of media about the problem, a lot of media about the problem. I don't think it helps anybody who's sitting in a dark hole by mistake to give him a shovel to say, dig more. Okay. I don't want to give anybody a shovel to say your the the country is reduced to minus twenty three to twenty six percent GDP, unemployment is at this rate, uh, blah blah blah, and all of that. It doesn't help. Why? Negativity is like the passing bee. If you want it to come to you, it will sting. It will sting. So why is everybody so eager? to listen to all of this negativity. What I want people in India, young entrepreneurs, the future founders of society, economy, and the nation to listen is that there is an opportunity and the opportunity is actually very big, but I will not give you larger than life stories. I will not tell you, oh my God, China is in trouble. We can take business from China. Let's not convince ourselves about things that are far from reality. Let's look at what we can do. India has a lot of captive market, which means if you are sitting in Delhi, there's a captive market in Delhi. Then there's a larger captive market around Delhi. Okay. Then there's a larger captive market within the north of India. Then there's a larger captive market within the country. Now, the first thing you need to understand, like someone once asked me, so how can I come up with a million dollar startup idea? I said, very simple. And she looks at me and she says, how? I said, all you need to do is come up with one product or a service which you and I can pay a dollar for, that we pay a dollar for this product or service. And then you need to find 1 million customers. You're a millionaire. Simplify your ideas. Simplify your processes. Simplify your proposition. And you will see that everything that's simplified works very well. And I'll give you a very good example. When Gandhi wanted freedom for the country, he simplified the process. He said, don't fight. I'm just going to protest. That's it. At the end, we got what we wanted. Sooner or later, completely or partially, of course, there were other famous freedom fighters who didn't take the path and they, they sacrificed their life and they did their job as well. But the reason why I'm using the analogy of Gandhi is because simplification sometimes allows a larger number of entrepreneurs to get into entrepreneurship. Because most people are scared of the concept of entrepreneurship by saying, it's too difficult. I don't know. Will I be able to make an autonomous car? Can I launch another flip car? No, no, no. Don't complicate it. It could be very simple for you. It could just be like the double wallas who are delivering food and ended up being a case study in Harvard. Okay, you could be like Lidget Popper, who are village working uh, women who became part of one of the largest you know, success stories of, of modern day India. 
there is a lot that young entrepreneurs can do in this current time. Why? Because COVID-19 has put everybody at home, which means you know where they're sitting. COVID-19 has also made people save money because if you're not out, you're not spending. We are not spending money on, on Starbucks coffee. We are not going out to eat. We're not going out for entertainment. There are no movies. Okay, so there's a lot of liquidity left. Okay, so you can really target. Because people are at home, you know, online is a good option. Because people are more health conscious, you know, health driven uh, startups will take more acceptability. Because people are more hesitant to go to schools, colleges, universities, online education is a good Think, use this time of lull to create excellence. Boredom is one of the major ingredients for creativity. When you're bored enough, you become very creative. So I think this is a very good opportunity for everybody to start thinking and start believing that they can do something. Always remember, what you can do is something that you know. Don't try to do something that you do not know. And when you try to do something that you do not know, try to learn it. You can learn anything in this world. If you didn't know fishing, you can learn it. If you don't know how to do, uh, play a piano, you can learn it. If you didn't know French, you can learn it. If you didn't know coding, you can learn it. Everything is possible. There's a lot of courses on online, Coursera, etc., which is for free. And there are a lot of courses which are peanuts. You'll pay $10, $20 to get amazing skill. Get skills. If India wants to grow, develop a new economy, create a new GDP, I want the young of India to develop more skills. I encourage education, but I encourage skills more. I think skilled people will make a difference. And skilled people are most likely to be entrepreneurs. And you and I were discussing before we started the session, and we were talking about how the Western world entrepreneurs, most of them have not finished their university. Why? Because they realize that skill development is more essential to entrepreneurial world than degrees because degrees are good for you to get jobs. And guess what? We are living in times and ages where there are not enough jobs and the number of jobs that are there are already shrinking. People who are very experienced are looking for jobs. So you don't want to be that person with a beautiful degree, beautiful master's PhD, standing in a queue waiting for a job. Develop a skill Get more skills, and I think, Anshul, your organization is doing a fantastic job of advising young people on what careers and streams to, to pick. I encourage such behavior. I encourage such engagement platforms. I'll be more than happy to, to, to do such advisory to your audience as well when I can. But these are the kind of platforms which will allow young people to realize that there is a larger world now. Today, you don't need to be an engineer to be successful. Today, you don't need to be a judge to be successful successful. Today, you don't need to be a doctor to be successful. You can be a DJ and be successful. You can be a blogger and be successful. You can be a VJ and be successful. You can be a dancer and be successful. You can be a photographer and be successful. Today, my 15-year-old boy is trying to launch his own startup using photography skills that he learned online during this last curfew COVID-19 situation. There's a lot you guys can do. Listen, when I was your age, I didn't have this opportunity that I would be sitting home for three months. I never had it. The only time I had it was summer vacations. And in summer vacations, you all know what we did. We just messed around. Now we're sitting home under supervised eyes of our moms and dads and our, our peers. Use that. Develop skills. Stop complaining. Stop listening to negativity. Stop watching negativity. If you see negative media, ignore it. Just ignore it. Very recently, someone passed me a very difficult comment on my LinkedIn post, something to do with, with um, uh, you know, religious tones. And I just replied to him saying, listen, whatever religion or caste or tradition anyone comes from, as long as that person cannot add value to somebody else's life, which means number one, his own, number two, his parents, number three, his kids, Number four, his siblings. Number five, his neighbors. Number six, his street. Number seven, his teachers. Number eight, his peers. Number nine, his state. And number 10, his country. And number 11, mankind. And number 12, environment. That is what matters. We don't need to have tags. We need to have emotions and compassion. 
So if India needs to move away from this whole negative of minus 23 uh, GDP, it's a phase. It will go. Okay, the, 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 the problems in economy are not COVID. They were there from 2015, 2016. Okay, there's no point trying to complain. You all have an opportunity. Uh, Anshul's organization is there to give you guidance on which streams. I am telling you, you all can be entrepreneurs. If you have failed seventh standard, if you have failed ninth standard, if you have failed college, if you have never made university, if you don't have it, I'm telling you, I am telling you, you can be an entrepreneur. All I want you to do is think. All I want you to do is give yourself time. God did not make you to fail. If God made you to fail, we all would have been failures. God sent us to succeed. It's just that we spend a lot of time in our life wasting, hence we fail. Leonardo da Vinci was a painter. He developed the sewage system of Rome. He was an architect. He designed modern day weaponry. He, he was a poet. He was a man of medicine. How could one person have so many different skills? Is it that the, in his time, Rome had 72 hours in a day? No, they had 24 hours. Is it that his brain was the size of an elephant? No, his brain was as big as yours and mine. We need to give importance to ourselves if we want to succeed. Education cannot get you success. Your commitment to yourself can. So I think my advice to India and fellow Indians is, this is the time to rise up and grab success. This is the time to show the world that our parents have raised that to succeed, not complain. This is the time. Wonderful. Rise up and grab the opportunity. That is a mantra coming out from Mr. Abdul. Thank you so much, Mr. Abdullah, for taking out time and speaking to us today and sharing your thoughts. I'm sure this would help a lot of startups and young entrepreneurs to motivate them to succeed and reach the pinnacle of success. For our audience, we'll also attach Mr. Abdullah's LinkedIn handle to follow him. And with this, we'll wrap up the session. And once again, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. And I wish all of you, uh, the ones listening, and you and your organization, Shul, a lot of success and a lot, a lot of good, happy memories.